Hello and welcome to Shared.Care's What is Manly radio show and podcast. Men feel more lonely, lost, and not useful in society than ever in history. Males are not attaching to school, work, or women. What it means to be a man appears lost. Is there a framework for being manly that we can unearth? Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care, and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Hello, Cohen. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Damien? Yeah, very well, very well. It's nice to meet someone else who's who's travelled around the world a fair bit as well. Similar myself, I've travelled to quite a number of countries, and you've you've spotted all around the world looking at your history, which is was great to hear. Um, and it's great to have you on the show for the audience. We have Cohen Geron here, and he's created an online dating management company. Um, Hovalo, is that how I pronounce that correctly? Make sure I get that right. Hovalo. Yeah. Um, he has. Yeah, Hovalo. <laughs> cool. I just wanted to double check that. He has more than a decade of studying communication, psychology, and how relationships work and what makes another person attractive, which has helped him become an expert in finding partners. And now Cohen um, took it as a personal mission to help executives, entrepreneurs, creators, and professionals find the exact kind of relationship you uh, they deserve. Um, noble work, uh, Cohen. Great to to see how you people helping finding love and find that connection in their life. Um, and when we're talking about what is manly, and and you, I would imagine you've dealt with this a bit. And we want to start quite broadly. What have you seen as far as men feeling lost, lonely, losing their place in the world? Um, what what have you noticed? Yeah, I think as a man, um, the world can be quite intimidating. Like back in the days, let's say you lived in a village with 10, 20, 50,000 people. Like the, the the person that you would look up to is like your your uh, village hero, so to say, right? And yeah. the chance of that village hero to be like substantially better than you, like, yeah, they are better than you. But let's say mm. they're probably only, let's say, 10, 20, 30, max 50% better, right? Like in a couple of areas. But mm. like right now, if you if you grow up, where you, who's your idol going to be like LeBron James? So you have like this guy who's like <laughs> six foot, I don't know how tall he is. He is like... <laughs> millions if not billions right yeah. so like he has pretty much everything maxed out so yeah. that's kind of like the the person that you're going to relate yourself to and i think even as like a successful people right like even if i would put myself against lebron james i'm losing i'm 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 a nobody right like i have yeah. like very little compared to what he has and even though i'm successful so that's very yeah. tough i think as a guy if you, because it's in nature to look at other people, it's very tough to be like look at other people and be like, ah, I'm I'm doing amazing, everything in my in my life is is well. So I think that plays a big part in like the decrease of manliness. Mm, that's an interesting point that you've raised before. I hadn't heard that put that way. That where we we do like to compare ourselves. There's only I think there's a few out there. I think it's the sigma males that they don't really care what everyone else says, but all the others tend to be comparing themselves and going, oh, you know. Um, where do I stack? And yeah, it's a good point that you raise that you know, back when you had a little village, there's only a small discrepancy between where everyone is. But when you're comparing yourself to the whole world, do you think that's part of that, the social media aspect and this online ability to connect? I mean, we're connecting around the world now as we, you and I are talking, and we do that often. Do you, I mean, just making that yeah. on bigger, is that part of that problem? 
Yeah, I, I, I think so. Because, like, it has massive upsides. Like, oh. I'm not going to bash the internet because, like, the no. internet is pretty much everything. Like, you learn so much, you meet amazing people. Like, it has massive amounts of upsides and, like, it creates massive amounts of productivity for a lot of people. But, of course, there, with every upside, there's downsides. So what's the downside is the fact that you are comparing yourself to everybody and that you do have access to everybody. At the same time, for example, if you look at the romantic space, uh, what you see now, what much more than what you see previous, is that people are just like um, hopping from um, um, day to day, hopping from relationship to relationship, because like at the same time, uh, you have an access pool to compare yourself with. You have an access pool of people to match with on dating apps, mm. for example. You have an access pool of um romantic partners so i also think that there's an influx in people who are um kind of going a more promiscuous route so to say mm, that's interesting and before we get onto that because i want to explore that topic as well but i wanted to come back to this point of um as you say we're comparing we compared ourselves to the people in the village um and there was a, only a small pond now we're comparing ourselves to people around the world and we're going oh i'm missing out on that is that more about self-esteem issues uh, as in exposing that there's weakness in self-esteem because the self-esteem is in essence you like yourself regardless of what anyone else thinks it doesn't matter what happens it doesn't even matter what you do it's separating that behavior um, from who you are so in, internally you know you're a good person and and that's all that matters do you think that's what this has exposed that there is that gap between people actually liking themselves yeah, that's an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting uh, statement. I think it's like yeah. So the way somebody explained self esteem to me once is that you like you have like you have confidence and confidence both situational confidence and like core confidence. And mm. I think like the core confidence can uh, potentially be attacked, and it's also like um, I think social media brings a lot of other um, downsides with it with itself. You know, it's very. It's much easier to be calm and be confident when you're in nature, in a forest, just chopping some wood, just relaxing a little bit, just doing some chores around the house. It's a lot more confident to be because you open your phone, you open Instagram or you open TikTok, you you scroll, you see a video, mm. but like you see a video that's like somewhat entertaining. But at the same time, there's like so many um, subconsciousness going on that you don't see what's going on behind the scenes. Like you're, you're, you're debating, is this person attractive? Is this person not attractive? Would I like this person? Do I not like mm. this person? That all happens in like this course of like one to one to eight seconds, right? Yeah. So I think all those kind of things, um, it kind of, I, I think the more you have to analyze other people, the more it can downplay on your own confidence because it's a lot easier to interact with objects and not feel it attacking your personal core versus mm -hmm. you interacting with other people and it reflecting like, hey, how do I stack up against this other person? What a lot of males will do, but also females, right? Like yeah. females also like analyze how how is her makeup, how big are her um, yeah. roundings, all those kind of things, right? Yeah. So it's for both sexes uh, the case. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, the, you, you're talking about situational confidence and core confidence because I'd heard it put that you, you, have, um, you have experience, which is you've done something a number of times and you, you've learned to do it well. When you first start anything, you have, well, we call it beginners suck. You're not very good at it, and it, it takes a little bit of experience before you get good at it. Yeah. And then there's confidence, which confidence is the ability to get back up, which we've all had. We all learned to walk, and they studied that. Um, studies show that we fell over about eight thousand times before we actually learned to walk properly. So we, we've, but we kept getting back up, and that's what confidence is. And then self esteem was, you know, you're liking yourself regardless of whether you're competent or have experience. And so that's where I was just wondering whether that's something that, you know, a focus of um, we need to focus on is just being better with our own self-esteem and going, hey, I, I like me regardless of how I compare to anybody else. I'm, I'm comparing myself to how I was yesterday. So I was just, just wondering what your thoughts were in, in that space. Yeah, so what you're saying is that um, people fall over and even though they fall, they are still okay with how they are, right? That's kind of the, Correct. Kind of the yeah. statement, right? Yeah. You fell over and, and, and I've had that. I mean, I, I remember I, I've tripped in the street and I've got embarrassed when I was younger. Now, if I trip in the street, I go, yeah, and everyone goes, yeah, and claps. And, you know, it's, and it's a completely different experience because I don't see it as a, a negative. So just wondering, you know, from that perspective, how does that relate? Yeah, it, yeah. 
Yeah, true. But I do think like it, it has to do with mindset, but it also has to do with um, exposure points. So, yep. for example, if if we get a client on and he's very bad at dating and yep. he goes on a date and he's somewhat um, somewhat confident, right? Yeah. If we have two of those people that are like somewhat confident and one over the next ten dates, like mm-hmm. eight of them are going horrible. Yeah his confidence is going to go down a lot. And that's only like eight interactions. That's only eight yeah. points of eight, point, eight data points, right? And the other person yeah. has like eight, 10, 10 days and five of them are going well or five of them are going I mean, the, the ratio is not yeah. great, but it's less horrible. Yes. So even though this only happens eight times, that can have a sub- substantial impact on the person's personality just mm. from purely eight data points. Mm. That's interesting. Because uh, what you're saying is from that experience, again, this comes back to that point of they're, they're looking at what they're doing and this, they're identifying the behavior as part of who they are as opposed to the behaviors of behavior that they can learn. Is that Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, it's just um, failure. I'm not exactly sure why, right? Because like, let's say you're a child, you, you yeah. fall down and yeah. there's like, if you have to fall down 8,000 times, if mm. you would have to date 8,000 times, nobody would date, right? So you <laughs> need to have a certain margin of success. I think with rats, they had an experiment where they had a big rat and a small rat and they played yeah. together. The small rat needs to win at least 30% of the time in order for the small rat to play with a big rat. If the big rat... Uh-huh. With more than 70% of the time, the small rat doesn't want to play anymore, which is understandable. So you need a certain margin of success mm. in order for you to have enough motivation to keep going. Yeah, so if you don't have that, that's 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 also what you see a lot within the dating community or within mm. the man community, right? For example, when you have the black pill, mm. if you get rejected a certain number of time after a certain point, you're just like, after this shit, I'm not going to keep doing <laughs> this. Like, what? If you just get rejected, rejected, and there's no success, and at a certain point, you're like, no, I'm yeah. not winning enough times for it to make sense for me to keep doing this kind of things. That's that's an interesting point. I wonder what that ratio is. Because, and for the, the listeners, they've heard this story before. When I was in the army, there was a guy in the army. He was a good looking guy, but he was dumb. <laughs> I mean, he was really dumb, but he was dating these amazing women. They were beautiful. They were doctors and lawyers. They were really kind. And and so they're just this this whole package of amazing person. And um, we couldn't work out why. How is he, you know, he, he thought maybe he's just well hung or something like that was what our, our discussion was. <laughs> so I thought, you know. <laughs> That's always the backup, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so we're asking, and so I went and asked him. I, I thought, I, I thought I, you know, I went up and said, Shane, I'm, you're not that bright. I did I just literally said that to him. You're not that bright. How is it you're dating all these all these amazing women? And he he turned into this wise Yoda type guy. And he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, Damien, what you don't see is I ask a lot of them. You don't see, you know, you only see the ones that say yes. You don't see the ones that say no. But I didn't ask the question that you raised that how many times he got no's before he said yes, because it's an interesting point. Because for me, that was a big life lesson going, well, it's a numbers game, not just dating, but life in general. It's just yeah. how many, you know, being clear about it and just keep going until, I mean, obviously adjusting, as Einstein said, if you do the same thing and expect a different result, your you, definition of insanity. So, but from that, you mentioned about that with the, the guys um, and they're going, you know, F that, I'm not going to do this anymore. How do you, I mean, what are the, the experiences you've had with guys that you've met and they, they, they've come to you? Obviously, they, they must have some hope left if they're, they're still dating and want to get out there. But what is it, what is it the, the feeling generally been with the, the guys that come to you and, and say, look, I'm, I'm struggling here. Can I, you know, can you give me a help? Yeah. So for me, it's a little bit of a different scenario because we get all kinds of, because I'm not necessarily like a dating coach, like an you know, original dating coach. And like, I always try to stay away from that because I don't know, I didn't really, I didn't, I felt like that would be like, that would have been like easy way for me to get into like business, but like mm-hmm. I decide to do other things because like, I think um, it's good to provide more value compared to like, Hey, you know, just be more manly. Like it's good <laughs> to give them actual tools and just yeah. be like, Hey, this is, and, and the things that we do is we give them actual dates. So they like yeah. a lot of the upfront work, they wouldn't even have to do. So we cut away a lot of the time and effort that they have to put in. Yeah. But So we get a variety of clients. We get clients that are like extremely good with women, for example, they're mm. just like, I don't have the time. But we also have people, mm. um, for example, a client of ours, like he's like kind of more of like an IT nerd. He never really had a lot of girls, consistent girls um, mm. in, in his life, right? He never had like a lot of dates. So if he would date, he would probably meet, have one date every three months. 
So mm-hmm. that's four days a month, uh, a year, yeah. right? For him, we got him like four to six days a month. Yeah. So that's like a lot more than he is used to. One of the interesting things, though, is that because he was never used to it, he didn't have a chance to see the patterns. Oh, okay. So because like we got him dates on a regular basis, he started mm-hmm. to see the patterns within the interactions that he's having. Because yeah. how difficult is it to become good at something if you only do it once every three months? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty challenging. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, you need exposure points, just like you said. You need to go through those failures, and then slowly along you adjust, right? But if you only like if you only date like four times a year, how can you adjust? How can you get? A, you don't have enough exposure points. Mm. So yeah, it's it, you need a routine. You need to, you need to have the amount of um, exposure points to 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 do the things and to become better at it. When I used to go out to bars and talk to women, like I would talk a le- minimum twenty girls a night, if not like fifty. Like I would just like yeah. in general, what I would do like when we started, we would just get into a bar and it was okay. We got like two minutes and we just talked to ten girls within like five minutes. Yeah, just talk to them. You don't need to do anything. Just talk to them. Hey, hey, I'm good. Bye, bye. You know, so just super easy, and then you go to the next one. At least you have the exposure points for like talking to them, and then after that, you can get better. How much of that, too, from that talking to them, is more about listening and asking questions? I mean, uh, I, you know, that's from my experience. If you know, women generally will talk to you, most women anyway. Um, if they're not interested, of course, they're, they're not going to. But if you ask some genuine questions, um, you know, how much of it is you actually have to do talking, and and how much of it is listening? Yeah, it's it's um, a bit of both. It depends kind of like how um, interesting does she find you? Because mm. like, yes, if you make her talk, like you build a, build a better bond, right? Mm. So you build a, build a good connection with her. But that doesn't necessarily mean that she's attracted to you. But if mm. there was initial attraction, attraction, right? If Brad Pitt does all those strategies, he doesn't need to become more attractive because Brad Pitt, right? <laughs> he already has all the attraction in the world. I say that about <laughs> he myself. He doesn't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's that's the if your if your value is high enough that she's already super interested, make sure mm. your comfort goes up. So if you have the the interaction, it's good. But if she's not 100% bought in, how do you avoid within the question framework to not, for example, land in the friend zone? That's tougher. How many, I mean, from that perspective, and I love that analogy that you brought up, I mean, how realistic is that analogy? Because, you know, you say, okay, you have a small chunk of people that, you know, will see Brad Pitt and go, yeah, and they'll swoon and, and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of people out there that, you know, a lot of women out there that don't like Brad Pitt as well. But is it? Are we distorting our thinking by thinking? You know, there's a couple of key people that, you know, th- that everybody wants to be, and and certainly there are attraction points. Um, there are ways to be more attractive, and you talk about that, and I've seen that on your website how to be more attractive. But is it is it realistic to think that just because it's Brad Pitt, every woman's going to go, you know, oh, jump into bed with him, or you know, give him a cuddle, or whatever? No. No. <laughs> so the reason why, like, I like the Brad Pitt, I often like the Brad Pitt and the homeless person analogy because, yeah. like, Brad Pitt has pretty much everything, like, body, face, money, status, fame. Like, he has pretty much everything. And he had the same hair as when for. he was younger, the same hair as you've got now. So maybe there's a connection. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, like, ult- that's kind of, like, the easiest way to describe ultimate value, right? Yeah. And then the other side, you have a homeless person who doesn't have any money, who yeah. doesn't have any looks, who smells, who... So you yeah. have, like, the... And, like, they both can do the same thing. And one thing will work amazingly for Brad Pitt, but for the homeless person, it's, like, not going to work at all, right? Yeah. So, like, if the homeless person starts asking questions to, to, to a girl on the street, like, she's like, go away, please. Like, fast. <laughs> or I'm going to run or call the cops. And he does yeah. the exact same thing, exact same questions that Brad Pitt. Yeah. So there's a lot of the correlation between, like, who are you? And yeah. the things that you do. There needs to be some level of attraction. Yeah, that's a, and that's a good point. There's a great, um, you can find it on YouTube, it was Saturday Night Live, did a stand-up about, um, uh, was was it sexual harassment and you, they called it, and they had, you know, the ways to avoid sexual harassment and it was like be attractive, <laughs> be handsome, <but> don't be <laughs> yes. unattractive. <laughs> yes. and very... there is, yeah there's some but what you're talking about there is that other extreme i mean if you, if someone comes in and and is is quite slovenly in the way that if that's a word slovenly in the way they behave well obviously that's not going to be as attractive um and there's something to do with that as i mean there's confidence and intelligence that goes with that an intelligent person's probably not 
you know, in most cases, not going to be dressed like a, you know, um, in, in, in a very poor way. Um, yeah. So from that side of things, I mean, that you talked about attractiveness and, and from, from guys, you know, again, feeling lost and not wanting to get out there. They, they might have tried it a couple of times. Um, and I've got some friends like that, that they had a couple of dates and that, and that, that was it. And that's all they ended up. And they ended up with the person that they're with. And, and some of them, unfortunately, didn't work out. Um, and then they're, they're back there going, well, what do I do? Um, how, do how does that attractiveness work? What makes a person attractive? Yeah, well, of course, there's always something to say that um, it's depending on the person who views it, right? Mm. Uh, so, of course, we first need to take that into consideration because, like, if you have a girl that's like very much like a nerdy type of girl, that mm. will, she would have like different boys that she's attracted to compared to, like, let's say the typical cheerleader. Mm. And besides that, um, not being overweight is a great thing to. Um, great attraction point right a great thing to become more attractive is make sure that like your diet is on point or like you go to the gym like that just purely like um if you are a normal figure and you gain 20 pounds your attractiveness loses like one to two points so mm. you can go from like an eight to a six or a seven to a five purely by gaining too much weight that's mm. like the one of the one of the things yeah um there's like style is also a massive massive thing that a lot of guys get wrong like you're well dressed mm -hmm. that a lot of guys cannot say that a lot of guys are not well dressed and that's yeah. i think one of the easiest fixes that 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 there is you know just buy clothes <laughs> that like look nice that are not like basic t-shirts like it's not that complicated guys we can yeah. do this <laughs> i love that in the movie the intern with um i've forgotten his name now the famous actor but um yeah, he's an old guy that comes into the, working in an yeah. IT firm. Yeah, and he's like, guys, just you know, dress nicely. It's not yeah. hard. <laughs> Robert De Niro. I think it's That's Robert it. De Niro. Yeah, right? Robert De Niro. And he's like, yes. yeah. And it isn't. It's not that difficult. Um, what other things do they could we look at as far as, you know, obviously looking after your health. I mean, that sounds obvious. You know, dressing yeah. nice, not that hard to do. Yes. Is well, that self-respect? Does that fall under that category? Sorry to interrupt. Does that fall under that category of self-respect? Being look out, I mean, when you look after your health, I mean, I mean, if you don't look after your health, what respect do you have for your body? You know, if you put yeah, it, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a difficult one. Um, yeah. It's also like incompetence. What I found is a lot of things come with incompetence. For to give you a, an example of what we're doing right incompetence now, incompetence or ignorance. Um, I think incompetence. I think in a lot of ways, it's incompetence. I okay, think, yeah. because. Um, a lot of the times, like uh, when COVID happened, right, I gained 10 kilos, mm -hmm. which is, it's not the most amount. I, just, I wasn't like, like obese, but I wasn't yeah. like slim. Like I was getting a belly. <laughs> now, that was like the first time in my life. Because when I grew up, I was like too skinny for words, right? Like, <laughs> like I was too skinny for words. Like I was just yeah. too skinny. Yeah. So I was like, well, this is a new reality for me, you know? <laughs> but yeah. then I was like, okay, I, I think I can solve this problem because I think this is a manageable problem. So yeah. I just did work to figure out what can I do to lose weight. And what a lot of the people find struggling is like you cannot eat the right things and all those kind of things, right? You cannot eat the tasty food and, and, and mm. you can only eat certain portions. But when I got into like my weight loss journey, a.k.a. losing 10 kilos, I was eating pancakes every day. <laughs> like uh, every morning i ate pancakes it was just a specific kind of pancake that i made mm. in a specific kind of way that was low in load in fat and carbs and was high in protein it was yeah. very filling but i ate pancakes every day i was full every day mm. i ate nice foods every day but it was purely because like i i sought out because we don't live like 20 years ago if you had to lose weight 20 years ago it was awful right now mm. you can eat pancakes you can eat tasty food there's <laughs> there's shit like uh very tasty uh, replacement for pretty much every food that you like. Ice mm. cream, you name it. So right yeah. now, I think weight loss is fairly easy. Mm. But you need to know those kind of things. And it's nice if somebody is like holds your hand and, and helps you along those ways. It's an interesting point that you raised because, I mean, uh, I look at it from the same perspective. I mean, uh, there was a time in my life I weighed 110 kilos. And, I mean, I'm six foot, so mm. it's not, you know, but it's still a lot. <laughs> it's, yeah. And I remember I was skiing in Switzerland and by the time I got to lunchtime, my blood, my calves were burning because I'm just carrying so much mm -hmm. weight. Um, and I lost weight simply by just 
I cut out a bit of alcohol and as you said, I, I just ate a little bit less. I didn't change what I ate. I just didn't stuff my face full to the point where I was and mm. I dropped, I think it was twenty five kilos somewhere in that area. Um, without doing any exercise, I didn't exercise and then went skiing again the That's same the following year, um, same place in Switzerland, and I could ski all day, every day, no problem, just by losing that made my nice. life much better. Um, and it wasn't hard, so I just that's why I wonder from that perspective. Is it you know, when you say incompetence, is it just not understanding that it's not that difficult to do? Yeah, yeah, um, I think so. Uh, it's also like not having enough experience. Like we were hanging out with a friend of ours mm-hmm. yesterday, and um, she was she was smoking, and she never like necessarily quit. Yeah. And I think like nowadays, like quitting also gets easier, you know, like I mm. used to smoke cigarettes and at a certain yeah. point I was, I was vaping, but like I've quit multiple times so yeah. I can quit. I know it can quit. Like it's not that difficult right. for me. <laughs> now I still fall back. I have like a heavily ingrained, like thing that my body's like, mm, cigarettes, that, ooh, this or that. you know, like very bad. I'm very aware that that's like a massive flaw in my operating system, but I did get confidence that I know. It might be an age thing too. I think when I was your age, I had the same thing happen with smoking, but I haven't had a cigarette for a long, long, long time now. So, but it might be somewhere around that age. Yeah. It's definitely (laughs) like if you combine that with alcohol, like just like Mm. the urge to smoke plus alcohol, it just goes wrong, you know? It just doesn't go well. (laughs) Yeah, that's very true. How did you, like, with from that perspective, again, with that competence, um, you know, and and not having incompetence, how did you make that choice? I mean, looking at, the, the being healthy and, and stopping smoking what made that choice is it you know is that a more attractive thing nowadays to not be smoking yeah so i overall like it's not very hard to see the roi in not smoking right? like it doesn't have a lot of upside so to say, right so if you look at it with a logical brain you're like hey that's just, i should quit yeah. <laughs> you're like yeah there's not a lot of pluses you know like in a, in a, in a column with pluses that it's pretty empty yeah so um there's a lot of different ways also, like a very interesting story. There's mm. a lot of different ways that you can quit behavior. So one of the reasons I started smoking around 15, 16, around that mm. age. I think I quit around the age of 20 something, 21, 22, 23, something along mm. those lines. And the way that I quit is like I lived in the Netherlands. I moved with one of my best friends to um, Budapest, Hungary. Mm. We were living together. Like he was like a big, a relatively big, scary guy, right? Like he was very muscular and he knew very well how to fight. Yeah. And we had, and there was, he was like, so when are you going to stop smoking? I was like, oh, I can stop smoking when I go to Budapest or live in Budapest. He was like, okay. So if you ever smoke again, I'm going to fucking beat, I'm beat you up. I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> he said that to me and I was like, okay, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> relatively scary, you know? So when I lived in Budapest, no way in hell I'm going to smoke, you know? Because, like, he can <laughs> knock me out. I don't want to get knocked out, you know? So that's a very easy way. If the, if the negative consequence is so large that there's no way in hell that you're going to do it, then yeah. you're just not going to do it. Yeah. That's, yeah, but right now, where's the consequence for you? When you gain, like, 25 kilos and you weigh 110 kilos, what were the negative consequences? Yeah, well, there wasn't. I was married at the time, and you know, um, it, it, it did affect my sex life a little bit, but not greatly. But mm. certainly, I didn't have as much energy as as you know before. But it was, I mean, it was one of those things. I think you know, I look back, and everyone loses weight to get you know get their wedding photos. I was a bit large when I got my wedding photos done, so I always looked better than my wedding photos after that. Which was <laughs> so I don't know that was a, I don't know if that's a deliberate strategy people should take, but certainly they're all, you know from my experience, I've seen a lot of friends there. They're chasing to look like what they looked in their wedding photos, and um, but I think that motivation. I'm just trying to work out from that perspective again from the the guys that are feeling lost and lonely. I mean, how did you? How do they motivate themselves to want to do some exercise or want to just you know, eat a little bit healthier because that will make them that little bit more attractive? Yeah, I think having um, I think one of the great things about um, how my life has gone is that I overall I have quite a lot of people that would support me, mm. um, at least that were like on the road to self development as well. So I think if you hang out with a lot of people that are just going about their lives and that don't have any intention of improving their life, how are you going to be motivated? Yeah. How are you going to be motivated if all your friends, all your best friends and your family mm-hmm. members and all of them are just stuck? 
if there's no vision of progression in any of the people around you, how are you going to be motivated? It's mm-hmm. just very difficult, right? Yeah. Versus, for example, right now, like I'm 30, I hang out with with a 22 year old, and you're like, why the heck will you hang out with a 22 year old? It's because mm-hmm. like the guy is like extremely smart. He comes from a very well off family. He has like he's busy building his own startup, right? So mm-hmm. he's he's already had multiple startups in, in previously, and right now he's on the cusp of uh, building another startup. And he's 22, you know. Like we can have intelligent conversations and be like, okay, so how can we? How how do you get better? You know, I help him with his business. He helps me with my business. Mm-hmm. Those kind of things. Like, how can you improve? If you don't have those kind of types of conversations, it's very hard. So if you listen to this podcast and you're like, oh, um, if I do an analogy, if I do an analysis on my surroundings, and you don't see that at least 20 to 40 percent of the people in your surroundings are moving up or working to move up or working to improve themselves, if they're mm-hmm. all overweight people who are like very negative. How, why? How are you going to beat that system? How are you going to beat beat, beat the odds? It's very difficult. So from so that, just, no, go ahead. In 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 my opinion, yeah. in, in those situations, it's better to downscale the amount of time that you would spend with them. You don't have to fully never mm-hmm. hang out with them again, but make sure that you find find uh, if you have a gym, find a find a find a group of people that you can hang out with that are improving themselves. In mm. the gym, you find people that are improving themselves in the area of fitness. If you mm. go to business meetings, you find people who are trying to improve themselves regarding bit, business. Mm. If if you go to like social groups and uh, like that kind of area, right? Like people who go to parties a lot, you will f- probably find people who are very good socially and would like to become better socially. So in that regard, it's like Find out what you're lacking and hang out with people that are doing it. It's very hard for you to be overweight if your five best friends are all chiseled mans that are in the <laughs> gym constantly and uh, constantly yeah. talking about gym stuff. Because at a certain point, it will trigger something in you and be like, actually, like I might also want to go to the gym. Or, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. So, yeah, I think that would be an easy way to get back into shape. A lot of times that intimidates people as well, but is it, I mean, the case, I know from my experience, and you talk about being fit and, and keeping coming back, um, when I was in the army, um, there was a guy that, that with me, him, he was a, we played squash together. Now, he was massively, massively better than me um, by a long mm-hmm. shot. In the in the three years we were together, I never won a game. I won points, but I never won a game. But in that period, my grand game experience, you know, improved dramatically. But the thing was, as as much as, and that was a real, ch- I mean, it was a challenge to play. And, and I like that challenge. I like my game improving. But the thing was, he was always really supportive. Even though he was much better, we shouldn't have been on the court together. And, and he went and played off, you know, with other people. But he always made time for us to have a game together. Is that something that, you know, the people listening, if, if they're thinking about going, oh, you know, what if you, but actually just go and ask for help because, I mean, from my experience, that's been the case. If you ask people for help, most people will help you. Is that is that generally the case from what you've experienced as well? Yeah, I think if you ask nicely, a lot of people will will help you. Mm. And even if it's not the first person, it will be the second person or the third person. It's also like, I think for example, let's let's look at fitness right now. There's enough people into fitness that um, that you don't have to go very far to meet somebody who is. Uh, who has a good physique for mm-hmm. example my nephew is is like a semi-pro bodybuilder you know mm-hmm. and and that's just in my family so the, like you have people in your surroundings in your village in your town people that you used to know used to hang out mm-hmm. with so the only thing is if you're really serious and sincere about that kind of stuff those people will help you mm-hmm. but you will see those like sometimes if you're if you um, get good at stuff you will see people who kind of want to change but they don't want to do anything for it so yeah. it's good to have some sort of sacrifice for it right to have mm. some sort of like hey i i am somewhat serious for it mm. you need to show seriousness to those people because if you don't show seriousness they feel like they're wasting time because the only benefit for them is if you get better they don't want you to they don't want you to be bad they want you to get good mm. so the only reason so what's the criteria for you to get good listen to their advice and put in the work you do those things, the chance of you succeeding is a lot bigger, right? If you don't do those two things, they waste their time. I don't want to waste my time telling somebody like, hey, this is how you should optimize your dates or this is how you talk to women. If 
what if he, if he never goes to talk to women after that? Mm. What's my benefit? I'm not seeing him improve. I'm not getting that satisfaction in my soul that, hey, I've helped somebody because I mm. didn't help somebody. I just wasted my time and then they wasted their time. That's an interesting point you raised because I hadn't really thought about it. But I, I certainly got that experience where there's a couple of close friends where and one in particular trying to help at the moment and you know just say don't do that and watch him go and do it again he goes oh yeah i knew i shouldn't and then he just goes and does it again and again it's like what are you doing man just stop it and um you know and and learn um but it's interesting to hear that as you say that the the people out there are willing to help so for the people listening you know just be mindful that just go and ask i mean being sincere and yes put in some effort but does it take a lot of effort, though? I mean, from a physical perspective, I, I look at my side when I lost weight. Um, you know, I, I didn't really put in a lot of effort in the sense of exercise, but I, I certainly made a commitment to eat less, and and I just did. I didn't eat as much as I did before. There was another period where I wasn't. You know, my um, I started to get a little bit of back pain, um, muscular back pain, and this is not you know if you've got serious back pain or any serious pain, see a doctor. But from my experience, I noticed it was it was purely I knew I wasn't exercising. So I started doing some core strength exercises and a bit of stretching. It was 10 minutes in the morning. And I didn't do it every morning, most mornings, not every morning. Um, and very quickly that fixed itself. That was my experience. Is is that the case as well? Do do people have to put in, you know, 10 hours in the gym a day or, or can they, you know, just you know have a sensible approach that's fun and, and to get to a, a healthy physique? Yeah. I agree with that it's very important to keep it fun and to make sure that it integrates with your your lifestyle. So for example, we were hanging out with somebody recently and she was slightly overweight. Not a lot, just a little bit. And she was like, oh, I hate going to the gym. And we were going to the shopping mall, buying some things and stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And then during our time spending together, I noticed that like she likes music and I've seen her at a party. She always likes to dance and she's very good at dancing. Mm. I told her, why don't you just go and dancing? If you like to dance, if you enjoy it, if you do it in a shopping yeah. mall because you like that music is on, why don't you just do it in your free time and, and lose weight and get better at dancing and have an enjoyable time? Mm. So I do think there's like easy hacks in order for you to get the things that you want or need at least to get progression towards the goals that you want. Mm. And sometimes you're fully, fully getting the result that you want, right? For example, with your, your, with your back pain, you just did the 10 minute exercise multiple times a week almost every day and it got fixed mm. some people some problems are more severe like you're not going to fix like a horrible financial situation with 10 minutes every day right that's <laughs> not probably not gonna gonna work out so some things just require more work mm. um, but a lot of the things you can fix with like some ease you know yeah, and just wondering whether it's more about that consistency of of having you know doing consistent things in a, on a regular basis makes a a big difference over time. Yeah, it does. It does. Being being consistent with with this thing with the work that you put in is very important. Yeah, and what about from the perspective of guys? And there's a lot of talk about guys not showing emotion, not asking for help. What's your experience there? What have you seen as far as as guys not you know wanting to ask for help? Because again, I I find it that for me it's kind of a little bit weird because I mean I was in the special forces in Australian Army and everybody there asked for help when they needed. They could all express them. You had to, but I, I think we were psychologically profiled to have that. Otherwise, you didn't get in. Now that I when I look back at it, I I don't remember what the psychological test was, but we had to do one before we could go there. Um, so for me, you know, I find it weird that there's this thing about men not asking for help and not showing emotions because the toughest guys that I were around, which were the you know some of the toughest guys on the planet, could all ask for ask for help when they needed it and could all express emotions. But is that the norm out there? Is that what people do? What they see? I mean, the guys? Yeah, I think it's very interesting. So I thought about this because, uh, like, I face this. Um, with my work because like i have friends who are like horrible with dating and then are like but they never ask me any help i'm like mm. why would you i know i know very well how to get girlfriends days you know <laughs> i i can get people relationships i can get people married i've done it yeah so why would if somebody who i hang out with multiple times never ask me any questions regarding that topic yeah so one of the things though is 
like which which is very interesting about the navies or with the with the special forces um, element is that um, when you are in a group, your core confidence is big. The mm. reason why a lot of people don't ask for help is because by them asking for help, mm. it signals, "Hey, I'm insecure. Hey, I'm not happy about myself." And if you're, I'm not happy about yourself, is let's say ninety uh, percent. It's very hard to say. If you're, I'm not happy with myself, it's ten percent. It's still mm. fine. I'm, I'm okay to say like, oh, I don't really like my shoes. What shoes would you recommend? It's totally fine because the rest of my life is fine. Mm. But if everything is bad, like you open the pot and you open the well and it's all rotten inside, then it's mm. very tough, right? So it's, I think that's one of the reasons why you see the people who have achieved more have an easier time asking for help versus people who achieve less because they're insecure by so many things and asking. So they, they feel mm. so bad about it that it's... That's the reason. That's where it comes back to that earlier question I was asking about self-esteem. It's it's one of those things. If you've got a healthy self-esteem, yeah. you don't care um, what else someone thinks. So if you haven't got something, you'll ask for help. Um, so you don't see it as a lack of confidence. It's a lack of knowledge, which comes to those three things, experience, confidence, and self-esteem. Um, so that, that's an interesting point yeah. you raise. From that side of things of, of that asking for help, I mean, do you help? Is that something you've dealt with? Is is helping like you mentioned your friends didn't ask for help? Did did you guide them as to how to ask for help or did did you help in it? Did, were they able to be helped in any way? So most of the people that are in that situation, yeah. So for example, a couple of days ago I was hanging out with one of my friends and I know I seen his 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 social media images, so mm. I know his social images is not great. I've heard mm. him talk about women. And so but I know that was yeah, so so. Mm. Um, so I just told him like, "Hey, next time come over to me. I have a professional camera. Shoot some pictures. You know, mm. upload them to uh, Instagram. You up- upload them to do your dating apps wherever you want it. But your online persona will do a lot better if you get proper photos being made. Mm. So I just suggested that. Like I was just like, "Hey, if you want, uh, next time you come around, we can just do some uh, photos." And it was like, "Yeah, that sounds cool. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Let's do that." Yeah. So that helps in order to. To suggest that, um, but at the same time, yeah, some th- some things require some work, right? Um, and people need to do the work in order to, because like I cannot necessarily give people like a quick fix, like here's like five minutes and everything is fixed, right? <laughs> it often doesn't work. So for example, with, with teaching people how communication works and texting works, like I have a course that's like seven to ten hours long. Yeah. Even if I give somebody that course, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna do it even if they don't have to pay for it, right? Because normally a couple hundred. But people, even if I give somebody for free, doesn't mean they're necessarily going to do it because they need to go sit through seven hours of material. Yeah. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> and that will, it will make them substantially better, but it is an investment that is required from another person based on time. It's time investment that you require for some, somebody else. Is that a common thing for guys? Because I understand, I mean, girls generally talk, um, you know, they're known for talking. They always talk with each other. They talk through their problems, that kind of thing. That that's And I'm putting a stereotypical thing out there for those that want to put comments out. I'm just speaking generally. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> I'm totally not like that. I don't read my comments. I don't really don't care. <laughs> um <clears throat> From that perspective, though, it seems to be that guys aren't as good as communicating. You know, is it is that what you're experiencing that when you see that is that guys don't communicate as well, even though they they might have a lot to say, they're just not as good at communicating. Versus girls, because girls talk about the problems more. Or just or ge- just generally being able to communicate. Um, I know I spend a lot of time in the corporate world working with communication and part of a negotiation program I have is, is a big part of that is being able to clearly communicate what it is you're trying to say. Um, so how much of, you know, but and, and I find that it's, you know, that can be a struggle for some guys, especially, I mean, younger guys are just not sure what to, you know, what to say. But is yeah. that the case? Do we need to have more education around teaching guys that this is how you communicate? I, I, it's probably a factor for everybody to learn yeah. how to communicate better because um, yeah. women also tend to not be experts regarding communication. <laughs> they can say a lot, but they don't say what they really want to say or what they really mean. So, like, you kind of, like, need to figure out what, what so what the heck do you mean? You know, like, they will, yeah. they will give you a five-minute rant and then 
it turns out they want something <laughs> completely different than what they just talked about for five minutes, right? <laughs> so that's a uh, that aside. Let's let's come yeah. for the man. Yeah. Um, I do think communication is extremely important and it also ties in a lot with confidence, I feel. Um, Mm. Even so that you are, if you don't understand how communication works, you will get abused. Mm. Like you will get abused by other people and you don't know how to handle it. Like how, how big of an attack is it? If you hang out with somebody, they attack you Mm. in a, in a, in a way and you are not understanding what's going on, mm-hmm. and you don't know how to handle it, it's very tough. So if you reach those situations, then yeah, it's an attack on your self-confidence. So I do think becoming good at both normal communication, but also like sub-communication is extremely important, and understanding sub-communication. Mm-hmm. And it's very underrated, and it's very underdeveloped, and it doesn't happen a lot. Yeah. It's interesting that because... You- yeah. Because I mean, I was just remembering an experience I had some time ago, um, where I was um, I was CEO of an organization. I was at a board meeting, and someone coming with some information, and I'm like, "That's not right. That's not right," um, because it wasn't based on the information I had. Um, mm-hmm. But it turns out it was right. <laughs> it was wrong, and I made a complete nut of ass of myself. <laughs> and it wasn't an appropriate thing to do in that setting either. But I was I was so sure I was right. Um, that I, I felt that it needed to be addressed there and then, whereas it, it didn't need to be addressed there and then. And, and if I had have asked some questions, it probably would have dealt with it a little bit differently as well. And that's where I'm wondering from that community, because you said sometimes, you know, you communicate, you know, um, you can offend people quite easily if you don't do it well. Um, is that what scares yeah. people from doing that as well? They're like, oh, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to upset somebody. Is that no? sort of double-edged sword there? A lot, a lot of- <laughs> One of the, one of my analyses as well is that the amount of um, people who have like very in depth knowledge about like how communication works is staggering low. It's staggering <laughs> low in the amount of people true. that like, for example, within my field of like online dating, like I would. So mm-hmm. in the beginning, it was like not a, like not a giant expert on like online dating and mm-hmm. how to communicate on online dating because like it, online dating is kind of um, a very pure sport because the only thing that you're dealing with is text. You cannot. Mm-hmm. You cannot put any pressure on somebody with your with the voice, with your tonality, with 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 the way that you look. You don't have those things. Mm. The only thing that you have is the words that you type in. And mm. if you mess up a couple of words, the interpretation is going to be totally wrong. So at the same time, you need to make sure that the other person interprets the message mm. exactly the way that you want to interpret it. Mm. So we have a rule: if there's a twenty percent or more chance that it's going to be interpreted differently, add an emoji to make sure that it it's that you yeah. that the other person understands what you're trying to mean. So yeah. if you're trying to make a joke, you add an emoji that replicates, like, hey, I'm making a joke. If you're being <laughs> that serious, you would say that serious. Yeah. Because like otherwise you have less communication. That's an easy way to mm. um cover that. Anyway, so when I was when I was doing research regarding like, okay, so how can we improve our texting? How can we improve our texting? I was just like I went to like ten different courses and the amount of like information I was in those ten different courses, like it's staggering low. So if I say something to somebody, one of the important things is that you're able to understand what's going on and you're able to label it. You're able to give it a label what's being said. So if somebody says, asks a, a question like, hey, how are you doing? Like, in what category would that fall under? Most people mm-hmm. don't have any any clue or have no framework of what kind of question it is. Mm-hmm. But for me, that would fall under like a normal hoop. So it would just be like a normal question. And the reason why it's a hoop is because I ask you a question and I require you to reply kind of, right? Mm. It's not a statement. It's like, you it looks like you're doing great. It's not a statement. That will be a statement. If I ask mm. you, how are you doing? You're required kind of to re- respond. Mm. So having a framework. And so if negative things are more... Um, bad things happen because this is like normal conversation but if somebody attacks you for example mm-hmm. and you're not able to uh, address what kind of attack is it what 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 is going on specifically in mm-hmm. the communication then you're not able to deal with it so i think that's very important if you're in general like for example i teach i have female staff and i would teach texting techniques to the female staff and after that they come back and they're like good it's super useful because when i have conversation with my parents with my family with my friends I'm able to understand what they're what they say, uh, what kind of category it is, and what they're like, what's going on, and how I can manipulate it to the degree where I want things to go. 
So mm-hmm. I know if somebody's like kind of like semi like flirting with me or attacking me a little bit or you know mm-hmm. if someone if things go boring, I know the reason why the conversation just went boring. You know yeah. that kind of stuff. Or if somebody elevates their position above me, I know what's going on. Yeah. And how much of that in that communication you talked about when you notice a conflict starting it? I mean, how much of that is being able to recognize that and then address it in an appropriate way to de-escalate the whole situation? Or in it might be a case yeah. in, in a dating world, just going, well, this you know, there's probably a bit of an issue here. I mean, generally speaking, you know, the best the person's ever going to be if you, you're with them is the first time or the first few times you meet them after then it goes downhill because everyone's, you know, everyone presents this wonderful thing at the start. Um, and, and if that start presentation isn't great, hoping that it's going to get better is probably a bit of a, you know, <laughs> bit, bit, bit of a delusion, I would say. It's like, yeah. this there's an issue here. Maybe I should just walk away. So. Yeah. One of the things that I found extremely interesting. I'm not sure how relevant this is, but mm. I think what you might, what people might want to do if they're on a date, for example, and if they're dating somebody on a second date, for example, make sure you come late, like half an hour, come late, have a good <laughs> excuse, but come late and then see how the other person replies. Because if yeah. the other person is going to be like really negative about it for the whole date and like whole date is ruined because you came half an hour late while you had a good excuse. That mm. person is just very high in neuroticism. You don't want to deal with that person. That's not right. a person you want to settle out with because you're <laughs> going to have a rough time if you do. Yeah. Um, regarding communication, yeah. So you need to be able to understand things and play um, and, and react to it in a certain way. So, for example, if somebody is being cheeky and they position themselves as a higher value person in inter- interaction and they're like trying to get the other person to react to them, mm-hmm. that can create like a frame battle. So mm. if you have a frame battle where one where the girl um, the girl thinks that she's higher value and she kind mm. of frames it as she's higher value and you're like what why are you why would you be so negative why why dare you say something like that if you go around it in a logical sense you're gonna lose like the, the whole situation is gonna collapse and you're gonna yeah. be like how dare you be so negative and all that kind of stuff so that doesn't work but mm. if you would use it in a fun way and reframe things mm. then you're able to get out of that situation yeah, yeah most people yeah. So basic reframing helps helps a lot. Clear communication often helps as well. Or like if you're in day-to-day communication, it's probably best to just try to repeat what the other person says. Just be like, hey, so if I understand things correctly, you're trying to say this and this and this. Yeah. That helps very well. What about for guys um, you know, being able to set boundaries that are, are right for you? And an example I'm going to give is, I remember it was um, a while ago, a long time ago now, actually, but I was with um, with someone and, um, you know, at, at her house um, and she had stuff to do. I was in bed waiting and I, so I was pulled out my laptop, started to do some work and, and I think she was about 45 minutes of doing whatever she was doing. Um, and then she came to bed and kind of snuggled over to me, which was kind of nice. And I, and I had literally had about two or three minutes of things to do. And, and to, my, to my credit, I probably should could have said, look, I'll just be two minutes and it'll be okay. So, But she snuggled for a bit and then, then I heard this <laughs> and she got up and walked into the other bedroom and went to sleep there. And I thought, I'm not chasing you. <laughs> I'm not chasing you. So I just went, I finished what I was doing, you know, closed my laptop and went to sleep. And next morning came, she came back in and I said, you know, we talked about it and I said, look, you know, I, I, I get, I probably could have said, you know, it'll be a couple of minutes, but same token too, you never asked me anything anyway. You just give a huff and, and walked away. She goes, yeah, yeah, the, you're right. When, and it was it was okay after that. How much of that, you know, do we need to as a guy just have a framework um, or a boundary, I should say, of um, of saying, well, this is the, the acceptable standard that I have for me. Not saying it's, you know, you must behave this way, but for me, if we're going to relate to each other, these these are these are my boundaries. How important is that? Yeah, I think it's a great example of of of, of something that you see often happen, mm-hmm. where like if you just repeat a girl's uh, behavior, like she will just be like, "How dare you?" Actually, <laughs> go out, but like, actually, you were the person who started it. So mm-hmm. if like you're not allowed to be angry at it because of this and this reason. Yeah, I think that's very important and probably something that. People who are too sweet, they struggle with. I think it's good to na- analyze mm-hmm. what's your character and what are you struggling with exactly. Are you too nice or are you too harsh? Because some people are just too harsh. Some people mm-hmm. are not nice. But if you're struggling with being manly, then you're probably too soft. 
So mm. an easy way to train this is try to create friction in your day to day life. Mm. So just make sure that you have somebody that that asks them something that they don't want to give you. Just in every store, ask them a discount. Mm. If you try to do that, you create so much friction that you're able to deal with friction like ten times better versus if if that's not the case. That's an interesting example because uh, I did that a long time ago, and yeah, it was it was challenging asking for a discount initially, but then yeah, it became something just it became natural yeah is that um from yeah. that perspective of um i had a question there, i got sidetracked um i can't remember where i was gonna go the this asking you know setting boundaries and and setting that up oh i wanted to come back that's what i was going to go i wanted to come back to what you were talking about before with the dating and you mentioned you know people going from date to date and there's a bit more you know um promiscuity that kind of thing um from a guy's perspective and, and i've read in in um uh, when they talk about toxic masculinity they talk about promiscuity being part of that and i'm going well it takes two to have sex i'm not sure how that's a male thing um that put that aside um but from that perspective and wh where is has that been because I, I look at it from my experience anyway um in long-term relationships it's a lot easier and you get a lot more sex than you do when you're trying to go dating all the time and it's a lot less effort as well what is the, this drive to to promiscuity? Uh, is it people just being scared to connect with someone and, and stay with someone, or or or, or you know the the, the date to date? What, what's happening mean? there <clears throat> for men? Well, I get well with man show, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I'm happy to talk about both. But yeah, yeah, for men, it's, yeah, it's the, at least for, for for me and for a lot of other guys, I think it's the hunt. Um, mm. It's very enjoyable. Um, to hunt for something um, mm -hmm. it's also i think it collaborates a little bit with the idea of like it raises yourself seem a little bit and it's just i think it's heavily ingrained into into your brain to do that kind of behavior um and i think it's very interesting that you can have a girlfriend that's like a nine and you would hook up with a six mm. like if you would label <laughs> yeah, women with numbers, like yeah. you would date, you would hook up with substantially less attractive women compared to your girlfriend or your main girl or what it. So mm. character-wise, looks-wise, you name it, like you would hook up and you would think like this person is awful, but you still mm. hook up with them, right? Like that's the fascinating part. You can just like go all the way and at the same time be like i don't like this person that much but hey <laughs> we got the deal done <laughs> like i that's kind of like how nature works in that regard i think it's more of like a primal thing and that people get like satisfaction through that because if you look, look at it from a logical stance it doesn't make any sense you go mm. downwards in quality in all aspects yet yeah, it's still enjoyable for um for for, for the man to do it so yeah and then it's tough as well you know because like once you reach the stage where you've had a lot of different partners it's tough i think for a lot of guys to then just settle down with one partner because mm. one you're not used to only having one partner you're used to mm. having multiple partners mm -hmm. you're used to dating a lot of different women and it's also like you, you're gonna reach a complex where you're like so this is a this is the the uh, debate on like why you should never hook up with a lot of girls, right? <laughs> so if you if you did, mm. what you're gonna have is you're gonna have, be like, okay, I want her personality, I want her family background, <laughs> I want um, her behind, and then I want yeah. her top of her body, and I want her career, and I want her freedom level, and so you try to mix and match Frankenstein level somebody into existence that does not exist. So you're always going to be disappointed because the person you're going to settle down with, they're going to be worse in certain aspects compared to other people. It's an interesting point that you raised. I hadn't heard it put that way before, but like you said, if you're dating with a lot of people, you're picking, you're making this, as you said, Frankenstein of all what you consider to be the best bits of everybody and it becomes this unattainable thing then and, and you're kind of stuck there. Which I said uh, to me again, that logic doesn't make a lot. As you, yeah, you say the logic doesn't make a lot of sense, um, and I know certainly from a you know my own personal experience in, in long term relationships, you, you certainly get a lot more sex in a long term relationship than you do trying to go out and hook up every night because you don't always hook up every night. And um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a interesting. Yeah, true, and, it's, at the same <laughs> and time it's a lot of well, effort like... too. 
<laughs> yeah. And what is also interesting, so let's say you meet this girl that you really like. Mm. And let, for example, she let's say she has an amazing face, mm. right? Let's say her face is just like exactly what you want. You get used to it. Mm. So you find somebody who has this amazing thing and then you get used to it, right? Mm. So then the, her being special and, and, and you appreciating that, if it's every day there, like mm. your appreciation of that goes down the drain, right? So I think... For certain mm. guys, that's just very tough to deal with because, yeah, it's just less attractive. So, it's, right? yeah, so the familiarity is creating like, yeah, it, we we don't appreciate yeah. things that are familiar to us because we've just like we don't appreciate water; it's abundant, so everywhere, and yeah, yes, that's what you're saying, yes. So you need to fight to you need to fight your human urge. It, this is depending on the type of guy, right? Because this mm. is definitely not the case with all guys. But some guys they really need to fight certain urges, like uh, very hard in order to um, stay in relationships, for example. And then you also have people that are just in relationships that where they can uh, the relationships are more designed towards the man's need. If you mm. have, for example, famous football players and stuff like that don't think that they never um hook up with any other people right i think there was like a famous case where like cristiano ronaldo like he had like some intercourse with some uh female somewhere and it didn't fully end well lawsuit and all that kind of stuff and he still was with his girlfriend so for um the the higher up you reach the more you can get away with it regarding um things that you would like to do that in normal society might not be labeled as good well, there is that element too. I mean, or using those those analogies. I mean, well, it's not an analogy. Those those um, actual cases. I mean, Tiger Woods is a classic example there. I mean, but you know, you, you lose a lot of wealth that way too. I mean, it's the biggest destroyer of wealth is it divorce can be for him. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a divorce and the, yeah, then you then you definitely lose out on a lot. Yeah. Is that a concern? Because there is a lot of that out there at the moment too. There's a lot of people concerned, a lot of men concerned about a you know getting into a date, then you know getting into a relationship, um, getting accused. I mean, there's a fair bit out there at the moment about you know men being accused of things that they haven't done, which is you know I've, I've seen a fair bit of that where I've looked at some of because I deal with a number of that within the courts, and um, you know you look at some of the statements and you go that that just there's no way that could have happened. It just logically doesn't make sense. Um, do you think that scares a lot of guys from wanting to get into relationships? It scares a lot of people to approach, I think, to initiate mm. conversations and to initiate it. Mm. Um, I think that's not necessarily getting into relationships because once you get into a relationship, you're already at that stage where you're okay. relatively comfortable. But it, mm. for example, it wouldn't necessarily... So if you meet somebody, for example, at the work workplace, it doesn't make difference like they're not gonna that's not gonna stop them from mm. getting into a relationship what is going to stop them though some people is when they see an attractive person outside um, in a bar um, in a supermarket um in social settings where they don't necessarily know the person and those situations it will is more prevalent because there's a there's a inherent risk right now in talking to women and being accused of a lot of things. Like I have friends who are just like, if they take a woman home, they record like an audio conversation to make sure that it sounds like nothing crazy is happening. Mm -hmm. Or they record a video of like, hey, listen, you allow us to move forward, et cetera, et cetera. If you're a high profile person, it's, mm -hmm. it's the, you want to hear something even more crazy. I was talking with a girl recently and her job was she used to have a job when she was like a end of high school or a beginning mm. of uni where she would try to honey trap very important people from from opposite uh, governmental parties this was not in the usa but this yeah. would not be surprised if it happens in the usa so they would like mm. pretend to you know, be interested in, create online personas, pretend to be interested in an other person and try to get information. Hey, where are you going tonight? Hey, where are you going? Try to know where the government or the opposite party is in order to potentially harm that person in certain ways. So there is an inherent danger in, there's attached to relationships in multiple levels. 
but doesn't that give bode very well for for guys that you know aren't so successful because they're not going to be part of that trap <laughs> they're not going to be targeted yes most people don't have to like only if you're like a very important job or like yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we're just yeah. trying to give the guys most out there that will be worried yes if you've got Relax. reason to be confident out there you're not going to get <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom yeah. yeah at the same time you don't have to like to be honest, my my vision on it is that you don't have to worry too much about it because reality is that um, most people are not too that important, and there's also not that many crazy things happening. You know, like sometimes you hear about like somebody getting robbed on like a Tinder date or whatever, or mm-hmm. something like that along those lines happening. You know, but that's happened for thousands of years. That's not something yeah. new. That's not like, yeah. like oh, that just started <laughs> happening in the last five years. It's also percentage wise, right? If you have yeah. a million dates, like there's, of course, there's going to be like at least a hundred dates where something goes mm. wrong. So, uh, percentage wise, it's not that high of a percentage where you really have to be worried about something bad happening. And what about from that perspective? Like you say, we're not worried about something bad happening. I mean, the press obviously sells bad news, sells. We know that. Is it a yes. case of, from that situation that what we see in the news? Is only really the minority of what's happening. The the majority is actually quite sensible. Um, related to weird things happening, like people getting um, well, just uh, when when because when yes, yeah, when we're going out on dates. I mean, people are concerned. You mentioned it, for for guys, they're concerned to go out on dates because there's all this news about you know she accused him of this and he went to jail and all that kind of stuff. Um, but really, I mean, that that's in the news and that's not what majority of people, I, I know from my dating experience, I'm 50 years old, yeah. um, you know, and the times that I, I got into. But you look good for 50. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Take care of myself. Um, I don't have any filters on. It's just normal. <laughs> but from that perspective, I mean, when I was, you know, the, the where was I going with that? Um, yeah, just from that, just getting out there i i didn't meet that many people that were i would put in the crazy basket there's a couple but you know the most were were genuinely you know i thought genuinely nice people um you know is that you know can people take heart from that from the guys that are listening can they take heart from that that you know generally what you hear on the news is not the mainstream yes it's not mainstream but you will Potentially, it depends on how much you date, right? Yeah. So if you're like a normal dater, you don't have to worry too much. For yeah. example, one of my friends, like he dates substantially, like he's, let's say, had a couple hundred dates. Um, so he had a woman that accused him of making him pregnant, mm. for example. Oh, her pregnant. Now, <laughs> yeah, making her pregnant. <laughs> it's clarifying, part, like, you never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fun part is you just get a good image from Google. <laughs> we like we both have extensive um, extensive experience with Google, so we just were able to reverse image search that that image that she sent. We just yeah. found the websites where she got the image from, right? So it wasn't very like well done. Oh, okay. But, like yeah, she is like she is chatting him a lot with a lot of things. Also like saying a lot of like shady mm. things that like inside information that she should not say business wise and stuff. So yeah, that almost created like a giant problem. Um, this was in Thailand, though. Um, yeah. So in Thailand, sometimes like the women can be a little bit more crazy. Yeah. Overall, you don't have to worry too much. What you should do is, whenever you meet somebody, figure out how emotionally stable is this person. Mm. If you're taking a girl home, figure that out. Find like, imagine like hey, if things are going bad, what's going to happen? That's the exact reason why I told you guys what you can potentially do is. On a second date or third date, show up thirty minutes later, see how she replies. If she flips too, you know, you know, you know the deal. Don't <laughs> hang out with this girl anymore. Like she is gonna become a pain in your ass, you know. If she yeah. starts you know, yelling at you, calling you a gazillion thousand times because you showed up thirty minutes later with a good excuse, you know, make sure that excuse is good because otherwise you just ruin a, good, a perfectly fine interaction, right? Because mm-hmm. there's. Um, a subconscious set of rules where people mm. abide up by. Yeah. Like you, there's subconscious rules. And the rule is if your excuse is good, you can get away with it. Mm. If your excuse is not good, you should not get away with it. Yeah. So if you don't play those rules properly, you shoot yourself in the foot and she's just going to be like, I'm not going to hang out with this person anymore. Mm. 
So there's a set of tests or rules and tricks that you can apply that you can use in order to figure out, hey, is she emotionally stable or is she just a little bit lunatic? And that's the the point. But at the same time, guys, guys, guys can also be the same way, right? There's yeah. like I dated a girl one time and she, her ex tried to drive over her with his car. Like she had just the most noxious things happening to her. And I was like, holy, holy shit. I'm not sure I can deal with this. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the guys are just as bad. I'm not saying that girls are worse because I think guys are probably worse at it than girls. If you look at prison, mostly are guys. So yeah. Yeah. Well, from, I mean, we're not, again, we're not pointing fingers at one particular gender or the other, but we're just dealing with the guys issues here yes. um and from that perspective i mean is it you know because we look at that and we come back to that start I mean, the, the person that you meet you know is it you know the, the when you first meet them they're they're probably the that's the best you're going to get things that you're going to have you know everyone you know no one farts in front of their date on the first date you know <laughs> their partner on the mm -hmm. first date but after you're living together for a while it, it happens all the time or well, maybe not all the time but it does happen um to use that as, i'm using that as an analogy so, yes, but from that perspective as well, I mean, you hear about, you know, guys getting offended or where a girl doesn't, you know, she doesn't like her, like him. She just doesn't want to be, she's not interested. Um, you know, should guys take that personally or just go, oh, well, we're just not connected and move on to the next one? I, uh, I want uh, both, do both. Mm -hmm. Take it personally because, like, you probably messed up somewhere because, if I do, okay, so if I really do my best, I can make, like, let's say, 95% of the women um, like me and mm. want to go with me. 5% mm. not, but, like, most of them, yes, because, like, I just know what to do. If mm. There's probably somewhere where you went wrong. Yeah. In that whole sequence, like, there was something that you went wrong. So mm. in that sequence, it was not like, hey, you didn't ask the right questions. In that sequence, it was probably like, hey, she didn't like you enough. She was not attracted to you enough. It's mm. probably not like did you ask her about his siblings instead of like about her mom and dad. It was probably mm. more related to like so what are the things that she might attract to you about? Mm. That's 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 a big thing. What about unconscious attraction as well? I mean, there's a lot. I mean, you can learn about unconscious rapport, that kind of thing. Where yeah. does that fit into that that category? Yeah, I mean that's that that that's big. You know, like you cannot necessarily like. <laughs> I mean, there are certain types of girls I do not like. Like mm. they don't, they can be like angels, and they can be have the best social uh, sexual acts in the whole world, and be like, be like, hey, listen, I can do this and this and this, but I'm not gonna settle with them long term. But like to be honest, if they can tell me a good story, like hey, I can do this and this, I'll probably take them out for a night, but <laughs> <laughs> they will not be there the next week. <laughs> yeah. So there, that that's important to mark. You know, that's. Yeah, there are certain people who have certain preferences in that regard. So ethnicity, mm. for example, can be a thing. Mm. Certain ethnicities are just more popular than another. Um, mm. Yeah, so if you have an ethnicity in a specific region where it doesn't mm. perform well, because ethnicity is always related to a region. Because in certain regions you perform poorly, in other regions you perform very well. Mm. Um, a great example, for example, is an Asian guy might perform very poorly in um, in USA, but he might do extremely well in, for example, China. Mm. The Chinese girls will be a lot more comfortable with that with uh, that religion or with um, that ethnicity. So, but yeah, um, there's only so much that you can do about it. So if you have a a, a deficit regarding mm. specific things, you need to make it up. The, the 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 more you can make yourself more attractive, but at the same time it costs mm. time, it costs potentially money, it costs a lot of things. So at the same time, you know, you're not trying to become Superman or whatever. So just see like, okay, this is the amount of energy that I want to put in everything. And then um if that works, fine. If that doesn't mm. work, sure. You know, like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend, let's say X amount of time to set up an elaborate social circle in this specific location just to try to wheel in some girls. Like that's yeah. not something that I would do. It would be very beneficial to get some sort of status and fame in a specific location. It's just not worth my time. Yeah. And from that perspective as well, when we're looking at you know attractive qualities, where does character fit in with that? Because I look at a, a number of friends that I have that are in you know 
well, they're much older than me and they're still together. Um, but when you talk about, you know, what they were looking for at the start, they were looking for character traits more than anything. Um, and admittedly, I mean, they got together when they were young, but people that are my age that, you know, are still together, when they talk about what they were looking for, it was all about character. That's what they talked about. Where does that fit into the, the equation? Or is that just a long-term relationship thing, not for dating and hooking up? Yeah, well, if you dated, like, for dating and hooking up is not necessarily required, right? Yeah. Um, from the girl's perspective, from you screening out the girl, it's not required. Mm. For her yeah. screening out you, yes, it is It is yeah. relevant. Because if you're like, okay, so being a giant nerd is not the most attractive characteristic, right? You mm. would find um, girls that will still be attracted to you, and that's fine. Mm. That totally works. You're probably a very good match. Mm. Those two things match very well. Yet mm. you cannot be a nerd and then be like, "Oh, I'm gonna get massive amounts of women, and I'm gonna get this girl and that girl." No, because your archetype fails with most types of women. That's fine because you're probably you're probably not interested in it anyway. Guys who are giant nerds often aren't that interested in that. They're often more interested in just finding the one and settling down and focusing on their hobbies. Mm. But that's the reality. If your archetype is not something that most women are attracted to, you cannot force them to become that, right? That's not possible. Yeah, that's a good point. And from that perspective, you talked about, you know, that with the people wanting just to settle down with, with um, you know, that one person. I mean, how much of it at that is having the ability or the, um, the emotional intelligence to recognize that, hey, there's, you know, 3.9, was it 3.97 billion women on the planet, um, roughly? And, you know, I just need to find one. I don't have to be attractive to all of them. I just need to find the one that actually fits well with me. Yeah, that's um, that's also a tricky one, right? Because, like, if you live in a village and there's only 10,000 people in your surroundings, yeah, like, like it's tough. Like, it's yeah. very hard. Like, when I used to live in a village, I also had, like, a hard time finding friends because I was just, like, I don't vibe with these people well, you know? Like, mm. like if I come back now, I feel like a foreigner. I've lived in so many countries <laughs> and done so many things. Yeah. And there's people who are just, like, they they moved three streets. That's pretty much their whole last yeah. 10 years, right? So I'm, like, how am I, I able to dad. connect? How am I able to talk <laughs> with these people? But related to your specific case, if you're a giant nerd, for example, like, like you're, let's say you're the dungeon, I'm the king of nerds, or Lord, or yeah, <laughs> you're the king of nerds, and you live in a ten thousand village, you're probably going to have a tough time finding your exact partner. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that people don't take into consideration enough is like uh, geography matters. Bigger yeah. city, the bigger the surroundings, or the mm -hmm. more willing you are to travel further away, the easier it will be to find somebody. Yeah. That's just how it is. And what about... Technically speaking, you can make logistics. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, technically speaking, logistics, you can make it later, right? You, you, it's, it's possible to, to travel for like an hour or mm -hmm. two hours. But of course, it's not preference, but it would be a possibility. If your specific demographic is harder to find, mm -hmm. you need to widen up your search yeah. or move. And as far as, you know, guys looking for places to just say they want to have, you know, they're looking for that long-term relationship. I mean, I think if you're looking to hook up, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You know, bars, you know, those kind of places. And as you're saying, you know, internet dating, if you have the right profile and that's what you're out for and, and people are both wanting to do that, so, you know, set it up right. But for what about people that are looking for, you know, they want to have, you know, that more long-term relationship? Is there better places to find, you know, uh, people that fit that category having a higher probability of, of meeting someone that's going to be looking for the same thing i don't necessarily think so because mm. like you need to see the trade-off at going somewhere and like mm. meeting some people so on all mm. the dating apps you can just put in your profile what you're specifically looking for so you can mm. just stay looking for a relationship yeah and if you're a guy um memo most girls are looking for relationships it's yeah. mostly the guys that are the players yeah most of the time the girl the girls just want to have some art girl are around it's like no i'm not looking for a relationship but most of the time it should be really meets a cool guy and if the guy really wants to settle down she'll settle down so if you're mm -hmm. a guy you're looking for a long-term relationship online dating works perfectly because most of the girls there 
like 80, 90% are looking for the exact same thing. And most guys of dating apps, or there's a big portion of the high performing guys of dating apps, they are often like not necessarily looking for something long term. Mm. So they have the best profiles, they get the best, most amount of matches, get the most amount of dates, and then you keep rotating them. That's kind mm. of like what's going on. It's certain type yeah. of fix and certain, yeah, for it's- certain people. So tell us a little bit before we wind up a bit about what you do and how you can help guys present them better, present themselves better online so they can intre- increase that attractivity because, I mean, from that perspective, if, if you're feeling lost and lonely and, and you want to get out, um, you know, the chances are if you are feeling lost and lonely, you did want to get out and, and as you know, Cohen mentioned earlier, you know, after a couple of knockbacks, you probably you know, had a, a knock to your ego, your um, self-esteem's fallen down a little bit. But hope isn't lost. There's people like Cohen out there that help you present that. Do you want to tell us a bit about how you do that? Yeah. So our philosophy is just like we want people to get results. Mm. The mo- the people we work with mostly are people who are fairly busy in their day to day life. So mm. we mostly work with entrepreneurs, high level professionals, because we do a lot for our clients. We're not like mm. here's the ebook, read the ebook, go apply the ebook. That's not what we do. <laughs> we actually do the taxing for our clients. So. Mm that's the majority of the work that we do mm. but we do we try to look at it we, we do the whole process so from start to finish so in the mm. first place we look at your profile we look at the things that you're interested in so we have a document partner preference where you can fill in all the things that you're looking for in a girl mm. and we have a document where you can describe yourself it's called like mm. blind description so you can just write down who you are where you work um, what what hobbies you have all the kind of st- stuff right mm-hmm. because there's no different there's no benefit in you telling hundred girls hey my hobby is playing golf versus you telling me hey my hobby is golf and i tell those hundred girls your hobby is golf right yeah. there's no difference in that that aspect there's, it's just like i'm just repeating what you told me yes so that's kind of like what we do we repeat what the clients say and we optimize things mm. so we look at the profile we help them with photo shoots. We can even help them with like fashion. So you would, mm. you would have a, a call with a fashion advisor. Yeah. And based on that, you would get a lookbook where you just can click on the images and you can order them from a workshop. Mm. Um, help with the photo shoots so the profile gets um, optimized. And once the profile is optimized, we do the, sh- the matching for you. So we match the women that you would be interested in. Mm. Based on that, we do the texting with those women. So we go back and forth. If you've already had chat conversations, we're able to analyze those conversations. So we'll be able to see, like, for example, if the guy's name would be Mark, we're like, hey, Mark, you do X, Y, and Z. Those are the things that you should not do, uh, but you do A, B, and C. So keep repeating those things Mm. for future conversations that you ever have. So we've been able to give them an analysis. Same Mm. time, we're able to copy A, B, and C lines and just use that in our future text thing. Mm. Or we copy them and we improve them a little bit. So we have a line and there's maybe like one or two words that just don't hit the mark right. <laughs> so we just improve those lines like a slight bit mm. and then we copy and paste them to it whenever it's needed, right? Awesome. So, yeah. You're giving, basically you're giving them, you're giving them training about, hey, this is, and you're teaching communication by the sounds of it. It's, I mean, and communication is really important to getting your point across. If you can't communicate, how can you do that? But, role modeling which sounds like what you're doing gives them the confidence to go out and do that is that a fair understanding yeah but i think the most important thing is like we do the actual texting for them which is yep. like so we legit get them so for the people that are busy you know it's like very yeah. convenient because they don't have to do it because there's a learning curve with online dating there's a certain learning curve because this is a harder yeah. for, form of communication compared to for mm. example talking to women um well, it also has downsides, but like just in your social social circle, talking to women in your social circle or stuff mm. like that, you can do a lot more with a lot less. With online dating, you at least you need to have a very good profile. You need to mm. learn at least some basics. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Do you give them like a, a packet, you know, a briefing packet going, okay, these are the messages we sent and, you know, just so that they know when they turn up and they, they know what they're talking about. If, when they, they, have, they have access to their profiles. Yeah, yeah. yeah I understand. I understand. <laughs> they're not like in the dark completely. You know? yeah. they're like, it's, it's also not a blind date. Like they approve beforehand, before, uh, yeah. beforehand they actually see the, see, see the movement. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we help them with dating as well. We help them uh, with the dating structure, like how to set up, what kind of dates should you do, what kind of dates should you not do, how to mm. optimize those dates, which stories should you tell on those dates. So we just try to optimize everything from A to Z. 
yeah to get awesome. the highest ROI on, on them, them dating and then it's just like a matter of experience you know like getting used to the whole process and getting used to how everything goes and then there's some people that are like super um they have a lot of experience dating. They don't need any experience. They're more like, hey, I just don't have time right now. I'm launching a business, for example. I'm very caught up with business. Please uh, set everything up for me and then I'll just do the dates and I'll just find somebody. A lot of people are like, this is like one of my first days in my life, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. And how, what's the best way of people to reach you? We'll put all of these details in the show notes, but do you want to just let everyone know? Yeah, we have a website, Hovalo, H-O-V-A-L-O dot com. That's the easiest way. Um, yeah, people can, uh, if they're interested, they can book a call. I'll walk them through the process. I'll see if there would be a good fit and if we have the possibility to help them out. And uh, yeah, I, I I like the business. I think it's very cool to do. And I saw that there was a need in the market. and uh, So I was like, okay, let me, let me go into this niche. And I like it so far because it's very satisfying to help people in their daily lives and getting people into long-term relationships, getting people married. Like, that's just awesome. Fantastic. I love that. And to wind up, what would be your key takeaway, your key wisdom, or put it in a nutshell as to, to what you think manly is? Manly is. Um, I think what you stated, having enough confidence to ask for help where it's needed, and then making those small incremental steps to become a better person, preferably with a good group of people, with a good good group of males around you who can support you and who you support. Mm-hmm. I think that's very important. If you have those things, most of the other problems will be relatively easy to solve. Yeah, love that. Cohen, thank you very much for taking time to be on the show. It's been such a pleasure having you. Very insightful, a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, that side of of dating and, and relationships and your your framework for what is manly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damien. It was a pleasure. Thank you for being part of the Share.Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.